Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation through PayPal. The email is debatetalkforyou at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to Debate Talk for Radio. Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed on this platform by individuals, callers, or invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. Sure. Uh, Primarily, I thought today um, would probably be fitting to have a discussion about uh, debt creation and how uh, the poor in general are victims drowning in debt, uh, generally the middle class and anybody who's not what they call the 1% or whatever title that they have for like the elite to run the society here in the United States and much of the world abroad. Uh, but what people are probably unaware of is that there are not just individuals, but individuals who set up institutions. Uh, Those institutions are generally called the system, whatever people purport that to be. Generally, I assume and state that the system at large is just a group of people who are impressed by a fixed mindset to accomplish a certain result, whatever that, that result is. And those people form that system. And generally, when people talk in systems, it's just people. That's it just people. At the end of the day, it's people who made institutions, policies, programs, uh, structures in order to protect their well-being. Um, When we look at how debt is created, I mean, I think I would like to have a conversation about that. Uh, Predatory lending practices have a conversation about that. Uh, Our own experiences with debt, everybody I'm sure would have a, a different set of experiences or some financial decisions that they've made to kind of put themselves at bay. But as much as we may catalog some of the conversation with our personal experiences, we should also just keep in mind that there's a broader um, audience. And when I say audience, I mean, you know, people who reside in the United States, wherever they find themselves uh, existing, that much of the world is engrossed in practices to place people in debt. So I guess I'll start out in part by reading uh, a little bit of a headline that was in Forbes magazine, New York Times, The Economist, etc. It says Americans paid $34 billion in overdraft fees last year. Uh, here's how to stop the charges. So they have a series of things how to you know, mitigate or, or stop charges from happening. But I'll read a part of the article. This is by Julia Chang. Again, they ran in the uh, in 2018 on Forbes magazine, but it went uh, across different uh, news mediums. So it says, ever took a look at your bank statement and think, ouch, when did I get hit with that overdraft fee? A lot of people are in the same boat. Consumers coughed up more than $34 billion in overdraft fees last year, according to MarketWatch, a data report on financial research firm, Moab Services. That's the most the country has paid since 2009. In the last caption I read, it says, but that stat doesn't necessarily mean we're getting worse at keeping track of our balances. The research also points out that overdraft fees have gone up. In 2000, you pay an average of $20. Today, it's $30. Credit unions have fees gone up from $15 in 2000 to $29 now. So, when we think about uh, overdraft fees, that's one medium I'd like to discuss. Uh, another medium is credit cards and interest loans, uh, personal loans, payday loans, and I also like to throw in uh, conversations about college debt and uh, auto loans. So just wanted to start the conversation and uh, kind of see if, Reese, you had anything you wanted to throw in just about what we said already, and I have some other thoughts, questions, et cetera, to, to walk through. 
Sure, um, and thank you for that, you know, detail because I think what we're dealing with when we when we talk about debt for our community is definitely a multifaceted um, animal. You know, it's something that has its claws in us in many different places, and I think it also serves us to talk about mentality not just the system itself and its, um, you know, mechanical structure, but us talking about our mentality as we voluntarily um, participate in this systematic oppression, especially when it comes to economic and political um, matters. So I heard you say things like the car loans, the interest, high interest rates, the, um, the things that we commonly deal with in a quote-unquote lower class, um, you know, tax bracket or as a quote-unquote lower class citizen, we we do have things that only affect us because we don't have um, the income to cover our necessities. So we end up living on credit, which I think is the point that you're making, is that all those all those fees and things occur when a person is living off of money that they don't have, which is the concept of credit and and loans and things of that nature. So I think um, on an even grander scale, which is usually my objective, as I said as a panelist, my, uh, my objective is for us to look at things from the highest perspective that we can possibly achieve and conceive together. So... I would say my main, mm, I I should say the thing that pops out to me the most about debt in our community is more so along the lines of our mentality. Because, yes, we do have the claws in us on a very physical third-dimensional scale where we're living on credit. But I think even more so we need to be discussing why are we living off of credit? Okay, why are we living off of credit? Um, Caucasian people designed the idea of credit as a sort of a benefit or a sort of a social tool um, that they use to enslave other people. And it's not just black people who are enslaved to debt. Okay, we have to start recognizing the game that's being played here because it's not a race game. Black people are not the only people that are enslaved to debt, as you mentioned. When you were talking, you were talking about how the world is now participating in debt, debt slavery. So we have to start understanding the concept of debt, ownership, and then owing, you know. that The concept of owing, I think, is probably even an even bigger thing for us to discuss <laughs> because a lot of times in our lives, we might be arguing with somebody. We say, oh, I don't owe you nothing. I don't owe you anything. Now, I think we should take that same attitude when it comes to the system itself. We don't owe Caucasians anything. They decided to come snatch up all of our natural resources, claim ownership of things that nobody owns, and then they say, oh, you have to work for it because we're processing it. We have the infrastructure. We have the organization and administration. So you need to pay us because we're the ones responsible for delivering it to you. Now, I'm just going to close out right now my thought by saying I think that is our biggest problem is we need to address that. Nobody ever gave Caucasians the jurisdiction nor the right to ever come to us and say, okay, now I own this and you owe me because I'm just out of nowhere claiming ownership out of something. Okay, now if we were to break that down into legal terms, it would take a whole day of discussions to actually make sense of it. But in reality, we don't owe them anything, and we have to start realizing that's the reason why we're being enslaved. Because, you know, the debt is coming out of a fictitious concept that that just came out of some Caucasian's mind. And somehow they made it make sense to us 
and now we're participating in it, and we're suffering as a, as a result. So that's that's my that's my perception of the entire concept of debt in our community. All right, Elijah, just right. to let you know a lot. Right. Vinny D is here. Vinny is here. What's up? Hey, peace, uh, peace, everybody. Um, I heard Sister Reese. I know Eli, uh, Brother Eliza's here. Uh, peace to you, Sal. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, peace to the panel. Um, and um, yeah, to peace. Hope everybody's day is going good. Yeah, so far so good. All right. Yeah, so we just started up the uh, conversation on debt. Um, particularly trying to address like predatory lending, how people find themselves in debt. Uh, mostly, you know, in the U.S., but I mean, we take it on a global scale. Like nations have been indebted to other nations based upon whatever uh, kind of construct that they set up. Um, but just wanted to see if you had any introductory thought. I read an article from Fortune magazine that also appeared in New York Times, The Economist, et cetera, talking about the $34 billion in overdraft fees that was collected in 2018 by the banks. Uh, I also want to talk about predatory lending, payday loans, car loans, et cetera. I'm not sure how everybody, at least on the phone call or, or on the panel or in the uh, audience, finds themselves transporting themselves around. Some people sign up for auto loans. Like, yeah, you know, it's what, five years or six years, and it's, $15,000 plus interest. I just want to address some of those things as far as how debt is created, how people find themselves in debt, and then the institutions that's kind of setting up those those measures. So I had some questions, but if you just wanted to kind of shoot off any thoughts that you've had around there and then have some uh, direct questions for uh, members of the panel to comment on. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, I um, – yeah. I can directly attest, you know, to some predatory lending. You know, I, w- I was in school for a minute. Um, I was in a I was in a JC, but I, I uh, you know, I got a couple loans. Didn't really get credit cards. I wasn't really messing with those, but I did get some uh, some loans. And um, I was uh, I was I was pretty backed up for a minute. You know, just getting the loans because you know. Uh, I was working at the time, but it was um, it was kind of foolish on my part. But it, I looked at it as free, free money, you know, because it was JC. JC wasn't that expensive, you know, the books and everything. You know, I was paying for. Was everything. that like a community college? Yeah, community college. Yep, exactly. Okay. So, you know, they had these. Uh, you know, you get loans, and so I picked up a. Uh, I racked up a few thousand just on loans, you know, just because the money was there and available. And then, um, you know, of course, I didn't, I wasn't really into, (laughs) I I didn't pay it back, you know, so I kind of just sat there for a minute. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, you know, to me, it was like free money, you know, I was like, wow, (laughs) you gonna give me money? All I got to do is sign this paper, (laughs) you know, so I wasn't really even thinking about having to pay it back or the consequences of what it would do, you know, but it sat on my record for a while. And, um, and I never, I never really was into the credit thing because I would just pay for mostly, uh, you know, everything that I would get, I would pay for cash, you know, because I didn't really feel like being tied down, you know, and nor did I think that I, they would give me credit, you know, simply based on my, uh, my school loan and other stuff. So, um, you know, fast forward probably about six or seven years ago, I, I finally paid, well, not six or seven years ago. Yeah, but about six or seven years ago, I started paying everything off. I started hanging with some people who was really into credit. And, um, you know, they had really good credit scores and stuff. So uh, I was asking them how to, you know, asking them how to go about doing it. And they start helping me, to, you know, telling me how to pay things off. And I got everything cleared up. And uh, I was making I was making really good money at the time, so I got everything cleared up, and then I started you know building my credit with a um, you know one of those uh, prepaid not prepaid but uh, one of those secure credit cards, mm-hmm. and uh, 
So I got everything paid up. Next thing you know, you know, probably about a year later, I went from having like a, a low 500, you know, and I got like a mid sevens now, you know. <laughs> now I got some power. And they're telling me you could just walk into this place and get this and you can oh, yeah. get that. Oh, yeah. They'll give it to you, you know. So, and then I started getting all kind of stuff in the mail, you know. That that was the crazy part, you know. So, I went, I went and got my first car, you know, which wasn't too bad, you know. But then I went out and got another car, and then I went out and got another car. First car, oh, yeah. I put, I put the down down, right? I put it down down. I put, I put about five thousand down on it. That is about sixteen thousand, and it was. It was like sixteen, seventeen, because it was my first car, and they allowed me to do it, right? And my payments aren't that high, but um, it's like uh, um, um, and at the time I was making good money, so I was just trying to pay it off, you know, fast. So I was making like double payments, and then I'll pay like maybe twice, uh, twice in one week or something just to get it down. But even now, you know, I haven't paid off this year, um. Um, and uh, I, I looked at it, man. You know how much interest I paid on that thing? Even making double payments for the first two or three years, uh, um, it was uh, six grand. Uh, no, no, it wasn't that high. It was like because uh, oh. I had a pretty good rate because my, you know, my my uh, my credit score was pretty good, and I put a nice down on it. But I ended up paying like uh, I think it was like ten or twelve thousand dollars over what what it was. So a sixteen thousand dollar car cost me twenty six thousand. Yeah, oh, ten or the, ten or eleven thousand right. more on the interest rate, you know. And so, it, yeah, it just ended up costing me. Hmm? So part part of part of this is, you know, people you know, if you're open to it, but sharing your personal experience with financial awareness and some of the early uh, mistakes that you made financially. So you mentioned yeah. something I wanted to hit on, which is uh, do you currently have college debt? And do you think that the trade-off was worth the trouble, right? So you did say that you got some early debt going on. I mean, I'll share my experience with it. Sister Reese, do you have any thought on, uh, do you have any early college debt, and uh, do you think the trade-off was worth the trouble? I have some college debt, not a whole lot, um, because I didn't – I wasn't necessarily feeling the college experience, so I just left – so that I could pursue my own education. And um, I don't know, I I didn't, I really didn't get too far into debt doing that. But, yes, I do have some, but not a lot. Yeah, similar to uh, Vinny, I went to school when I was 17 years old, you know, down in North Carolina, and black HBCU, the day you get there, probably that same week, probably the same couple uh-huh. weeks. They got lines and lines and lines of oh. little booths set up, giving you free whatever they was giving out at the time, you know, little footballs and trinkets and little mugs. and They call it swag now. I don't know what it was called back then, but stuff to hype you up to sign up for this and sign up for that. And as far as I was concerned, you know, I made a lot of money as a teenager because I worked mm-hmm. and had some other enterprising uh, things that, that were going on. And um, interestingly enough, you know, you sign up, did the same thing, you know, here, $1,000 over here, $500 over here, $1,000 over here. Yeah. And I made That's money. Up. It wasn't about, it wasn't about, I didn't have the money, but hey, you mm-hmm. know, it's $25 a month. So eh, mm-hmm. I'll pay it at some point and never, never probably sent in maybe three payments. And those institutions, I mean, later they changed the law that said you can't set up at a college and get 18-year-olds in debt, et cetera, et cetera. But um, at those institutions, and it just wasn't the college I was in, like everybody I know who was in school, no matter where they were, North Carolina, California, was signing up to go huh. get themselves a credit card, and it was free money. Now, uh-huh. what the system at large was doing was playing on the ignorance and youth and pride of kids, right. right? Like knowing that, you know, this kid is going to go buy what? You know, a stereo system, some sneakers and a jacket, and <laughs> turn around and show his friends. And for that one jacket that was 200, we're going to charge him 800, you know, over the course uh-huh. of time, maybe 1500. Uh, 
it wasn't until later that I became aware of that. You no, know, it's a whole system, right? I mean, it's, it it's people who hold, they hold conventions. Like, you know, people here uh, go to concerts, uh, Boys to Men or Jay-Z or whoever the new, new popular artist is. It's people who go to conventions like that to learn how to trap you and I into debt, you know? Huh. It's whole meetings and conventions. I come to find out Vegas has a big one. Uh, several times a year. So, again, like people find themselves in their mind innocently just, you know, trying to live beyond their means, partially because they weren't shown and then partially because it's people who are out here who are capitalizing off of the ignorance of brown and black people and poor people at large. So did anybody else join in, Sal, um, in terms of uh, host? Uh, nobody else at this time, but I'll keep you posted. Okay, cool. So yeah, just wanted to start out with the uh, like the the college debt experience. So by the time it was all done, between signing up for them uh, institutions that they call schools, uh, the credit cards, and whatever else I had going on, I probably walked out with about maybe like seven to twelve thousand dollars in debt, fourteen thousand. Uh-huh. Um, and then it wasn't until probably like oh four, a buddy of mine uh, who I used to do music with was like, "Yo, bro, he found his method to flush." He used, he used to call it flushing it down the toilet. Um, yeah. Like, bro, I just flushed twenty seven k down the toilet. I'm like, "What? He did what?" <laughs> so he told me like, "Yo, man, you can go do this, that, and the third, and you know, declare banks with me, man. You'll get loans right again." So I did some research on it, got an attorney, and like all of them debts that I could not pay, like uh-huh. either because my attention wasn't there or my resources weren't there at the time. Uh, yeah, man, I went to the, to, to the court system and they eliminated all of it except the federal debt. And, wow. you know, again, if you've ever attended college, uh, the federal debts don't disappear, so you can't flush uh-huh. uh, student loans down because the federal government ain't going to let you discharge debt that you owe them. Um, right. So you go back and forth between you know, in my time, it was deferment to paying to deferring again to uh-huh. being delinquent, and then finally just saying, you know what, I got to get rid of this, right? Yeah. And ended up paying it off, which was probably like seven or eight thousand dollars at one point. Um, uh-huh. So now I'm like free of that. No more, no more me attached to to those debts. Anybody have any other thoughts on like college debt, the institution that they set up, and and um. You know, what they even I know some of y'all have uh children, what do y'all hope in terms of not having them repeat the cycle that was probably set up for us? Um, yeah. Uh so yeah, yeah, I have uh I have three children. So I basically you know, telling them I try to instill in them like when you owe people it's pretty much like you're you're kind of a slave when you owe, you know. Like even if you go out and buy a car, it would be better to go out and buy like something that you could pay for with cash, and then not just not be in debt, you know. And and then if you if you're going to school, if you really don't need the loans, you know, don't do it, you know. Especially if you're not uh, savvy on the the, the predatory lending that goes on there, you know, but I, I try to, I try to tell them all about it, you know, and, and basically just try to instill in them that, you know, uh, being in debt to somebody is like, is like slavery, especially if you can't afford it. Like it's never, it's never a good thing to borrow money if you don't have money, you know, on it. I mean, unless you're doing like a, some kind of big purchase or something like that, but it's never really a good idea to borrow money unless you don't have it. I mean, if you don't have it, because all you're gonna do is get yourself into a twist, you know. Especially if you don't, if you're not, if you're not, um, um, ah, I'm losing my words here. I'm a little tired, but excuse me. But um, discipline. If you're not disciplined enough to uh, to keep up on your on what you pay and what you owe. But that's well, what I'm trying to tell my kids. Uh, uh, but brother BA is here. BA, what was 
Welcome, greetings, brothers. I'm just sitting back and I'm listening. Peace, B.A. Peace to you, brother. Well, since you, since you uh, jumped in, welcome. And uh just wanted to see if you can share uh, with discussing, you know, kind of drowning in debt and primarily the institutions that set up the system or the people who set up the systems that create debt and have people mostly poor, mostly poor. I mean, but I know a lot of rich people, like multimillionaires that I know that's in debt too. I mean, at some point when you, uh, when they're candid about it, they have debt too. I mean, they just probably got a higher probability of paying it off at some point, but some people shuffle around the, the really wealthy people. I know that they shuffle around the debt and then, you know, shelter it out. But one to see one of our first questions was like the experience with, uh, to co- with college. And then if you got caught in any debt traps while you were in college. No, not me personally. I, I've never been any type of debt when it came to going to school. Um, I was, uh, I know about 10 years ago, I was going to city college and, uh, it didn't require me to, uh, pay any, pay uh, too much for any classes or anything like that. Uh, but when it comes to debt overall, it just seems to me that, um, living in this country, that, um, uh, debt is part of the, tr- of the tradition. It's just a, it's like an American tradition. Like America would be America. Or capital Americans the version of capitalism wouldn't be what it is without debt, because it's always the institutions or those who control wealth who to have the advantage when it comes to debt. I would say. Oh yeah, no, I agree. I, I would say something interesting. Um, credit cards themselves didn't appear in its current form until about 1983, 1984. If you study like economic history in the United States, you see what some of the economic shifts were going on at that time when a lot of resources weren't available, but in order to trap the people into still buying their fantasy, you know, this this thing called credit cards actually formally came out. But more interesting than that, so this is 83, 84, right, in the United States. More interesting than – sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, brother. No, I'm listening. Go oh. ahead. More interestingly than that, uh, you're probably familiar. I spent the last couple months, like November to January, um, in Cuba. And when we were having conversations with the Cubans, uh, just about everywhere you go, I'm explaining. You know, some people are fascinated with America. Some people despise America and told me verbatim, like, that's our primary enemy, Right. So getting these contexts are very important, talking to a lot of the residents in the country. Um, one of the things I began to explain to them is how here in the United States, most people go to institutions of higher learning, right? So what they call higher learning, community college, uh, IT academies, four-year universities, colleges, et cetera. And then the fees that's attached to it, right? And the, the amount of debt that people are in by just – going to go get themselves so-called educated. Um, Not only is education at no cost to them, they often are paid to attend school, right? So I think that that's interesting. Secondly, as we talked about credit cards and how the system works, you can't use any American credit cards down there, period, right? 95% of the places you go, you can't use any American credit cards at all. But more interestingly, none of them have any debt, like none that I talked to. Like, hey, you know, y'all don't have like loans or, you know, such and such where you're in debt. No. As a national practice, they don't have debt. So the the average American is uh, $15,000 down in just consumer debt. The average Cuban has no debt at all. None. Like zero. So just want to throw that out there and share your thoughts on that. That's pretty amazing, you know, and, uh, you know, what the weird thing is, like, um, I know a lot of people, well, I know a couple of leaders that were, you know, moving towards that, like, uh, uh, that would actually help the people. It seems like, um, 
over here, it's like they try to hurt the people, you know, or they, they're, it's, it's exactly what it's called, predatory, you know. Everything is uh, built off of um, the backs of somebody else, you know. Nobody wants to really gain the dollar, you know, earn the money no more. They want to, like, you know, uh, what, is, what do they call it, OPE, other people's efforts or something like that, you know, an acronym. Or, or they will um, say exportation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. It's the same exact thing. And that's weird how this, this country thrives off of that, you know. Uh, I don't, you know, it's weird. And, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. I'll yield on that for right now. That's one reason why I was saying that we really need to look at mentality when it comes to death because that type of stuff, you know, with predatory lending, like I'm pretty sure you would never get caught up in a predatory lending situation anymore because you've now had the experience to educate you about what that Mm -hmm. is and what it can do to you. And so I think, like I said, the mentality of how we approach our finances is really get, getting in our way of growing and us accumulating any wealth. And so um, I think it's, it's important for us to do our best to just acknowledge the fact that we have a role in this position that we have. You know, if we were to be approaching our financial situations the same way Caucasian people do, then maybe we would be looking more similar to the way Caucasians look financially. Um, but so be, we what do you think tell, that looks like? Um, well, we can tell that there's a mentality of the way black people approach spending money. You see, black, black people don't understand that money is a tool to be used for your life necessities. But there is a certain way that you use a tool. You don't spend it. You don't spend the money, you use it. And so what we have to start understanding is that money is not something that is meant to be spent. The money is meant to be used. And when we start learning how to use money, then we'll get out of that spending mentality that's keeping us in debt. I know a lot of black people approach their financial situations as if um, because they have it, they need to spend it. Like, for example, you might have, let's say you have $5,000 worth of monthly income every month. You decide that you deserve to be in a luxury apartment that costs you $1,800 a month when you're a single person. This is how I was living. I didn't pay $1,800 a month but it was my apartment was more expensive than it had to be for it to just be me by myself. So we have situations like that where we will max out our monthly income so that there so that we can blame our debt on oh I gotta pay these bills. But see the real situation there is you're too bougie. Okay? You're too to get yourself to get your act together you want the best of the best of everything you're not willing to compromise on what you feel you deserve you want to keep up with the Joneses you want to be fly you want to be clean you want to be popping and all this other stuff you don't want to sacrifice anything none of your quality of living for the sake of you having financial success And so this is where we get caught up is because our mentality is geared towards spending money. It's not geared towards using money. Today I wrote past a a post on Instagram where a man was giving his breakdown of how he spends his weekly check. That was $42,000. He got a check in one week, $42,000. What he tried to explain was that he learned by investing in his education, he learned that money is to be used and not spent. So he decided that instead of him going out and buying Jordans and popping off at the club and doing all of this stuff with women and all of these other fruitless things, 
He decided, I'm going to start spending my money on the stock market, $500 here, $500 there. I'm going to start spending my monthly check, which at the time he said was only $2,000. So he worked his way from $2,000 a month all the way up to $42,000 in one week because he changed his mental approach to from uh, using money, I mean, excuse me, from spending money to using money. So he explained in his post that what he was doing was buying streams of income. He was using his money to buy more money, basically. If you go out and buy a stock or a dividend that pays you every quarter or however, whatever term you decide, you're buying a stream of income with that. Yeah, I think part of that is the I think part of that is the solution and the challenge, right? So in, in conventional wisdom, that's the solution, right? You go out there and diversify your uh, portfolio, put into income streams that can generate more revenue. What I'm suggesting is that the same revenue that is going to create it for one that's going to be looked at as prudent and the person to follow is entrapping the next person in debt. So for example, the person who owns stock in Bank of America, kudos. You're going to get high dividends when they, when they NASDAQ and the Dow goes up. Uh, and then it's time for those shares to be dispersed. But the person who is the victim of overdraft fees, when you buy something in your account for $7 or $70, either or, but you only have $5 or $50 in there, Mm -hmm. then your account overdrafts, that poor person is being charged $35 or whatever it is, plus another $35 after so many days and another fee on on top of that. And the person who's benefiting off of it, the guy who's making 42000 he's living at large. Like, yo, y'all need to do this. But it creates a cycle of poverty for a whole other people. Now, second, as I was mentioning a little earlier, the conventions that uh, – they have an auto loan convention – in um in Las Vegas every year, right? I forget the name of it. I'll think of it, hopefully. In that convention, what they do is they prey on people who have medium to low credit scores, right? Now, okay. I want to push back on the narrative that black people just don't spend money the right way. I, I don't live uh, in California or L.A. or like Atlanta, right? But the two things I know about L.A. and Atlanta – is the transportation systems are not very good, right? Mm-hmm. So if you live in no, one they're place, not, they're not at all. Yeah. So if you live in like one side of LA and you work, you can easily, and I'm talking about the lower income people, <clears throat> middle class notwithstanding, but you could easily be on the bus for two and a half to four hours to get to work in some cases and to get back to work for a total trip. Right, so a person say, listen, I got daycare, I got to go to work from 9 to 5, I got to drop the kids off. It's better for me to have a vehicle knowing I only make $11.58 an hour. But mm-hmm. you got a convention in, a convention in, in Vegas and New York and, and uh, Florida that happens annually. They say, hey, y'all want to target people who only make $11 an hour to sell this used $5,000 car to. So when they buy the car, they can't afford it. And we know enough about economics and algebra to know that when you buy the car, we're giving it to you because you cannot afford it. Now, again, the narrative may be like, you know, brown people don't spend money the right way. I'm challenging that narrative to say they're trapped sometimes into spending money the wrong way because their ancestors, in some cases, were deprived of opportunities or didn't do the right thing either or. So that young person was making Eleven dollars and fifty-eight cents an hour, taking the bus for three hours. So you know what? I'm sick of it. I'm going to use some of my tax return and use some of my check to go get an automobile. That automobile they buy, it breaks down. They get a repo because they could never afford it. And then that person who sold them the automobile sells it to the very next person who's making under the amount to pay. And that automobile that may have been sold for $5,000 the first time is eventually made to sell over a hundred thousand dollars worth 
because they trapped 20 people in that same scheme. Now, on the other end of that, the individual who sold the automobile, happy is he. He's like, listen, I made 100K off of 5K. I've diversified my portfolio. I'm doing good for myself. I mean, if you study the scriptures, mm-hmm. there's no narrative of like, you know, the rich, the the, the guy who said, look, I'm going to tear, tear down my barns and I'm going to build greater, right? So mm-hmm. while he was trapping the poor into debt, but the poor didn't see that coming. I mean, he just like, mm-hmm. or she just like, I don't want to take the bus for three hours, uh, drop my son off at school and or whatever else and get to work. I want to make it more convenient. So there's a whole other narrative going on that I want to address. I just wanted to just inter- just to interject real quick, and uh, maybe just uh, most definitely open the conversation up a little wider. What you just brought up, this stuff is legal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This, you know, what I'm saying it, this. This is the thing. These are the things that get passed through legislation, and this stuff people get away with who are in power. Um. So we see that the people who benefit from these type of schemes and scams on the poor, uh, the bankers, insurance companies, and who and, and who's in their pockets? The politicians. The politicians, yeah. Who sign who signed the bills. And then the poor, the, the evidence is right there that these things are happening, but for some reason we just sit back and we continue to spend money or we continue to participate in this unjust system. It's mm-hmm. unjust. And and this is why the United States empire is in the conditions that is that it's in now because when people have a lot of wealth, it just doesn't come honestly. It comes from robbing and cheating and stealing and skipping and scamming. And mm-hmm. you see that there's this billions, I mean these people are making billions and billions of dollars. If it's not just scamming them off cars, off credit cards, they're scamming the people through their labor. Oh, yeah. uh, the inequality, you know what I'm saying? Even wage labor. That's a whole and that's a whole nother dynamic within this conversation. I just want to share that. No, I think you said two things that was interesting. I just want to jump back in and say one, uh, I think Sister Reese was saying like we won't make the same mistakes because we got better educated. One of the challenges that I think that was BA that was bringing up is that is if we get educated today, that education could be outdated by next month because the policies yeah. change, right? And it's yeah. difficult to stay on grass with, like, everybody who got loans back in 2001, 2002, when subprime, was, uh, subprime mortgages was the, the thing. You had people who have been in uh, housing uh, projects or rental housings who finally were able to get themselves a loan to get a house, which was, you know, in some cases what people call the American dream. And hmm. they mortgage ballooned on them. It went from 800 to 1800 and they ended up oh, with a house. I mean, that's the whole crash of 2008. So, yeah. you know, I'm again saying that we can be thoroughly educated today. And because these uh, demons, I guess is the best word, because they are so nefarious. They're constantly saying, listen, let's just switch it around like this and come up with this new scheme or mm-hmm. let's change the policy so now we can trap the person who knew yesterday into a whole new type of debt. Yeah, yeah they that's, react. That's, they react fast. They react very fast. Oh, yeah. And oh, that's yeah. the truth. Oh, yeah. you, walk in, yeah. you walk into a bank to go open up an account, right? If you get a checking account, they push. I think they're they're told to push the uh, the um, overdraft option, you know, because they make that yeah. much money off of it, you know. Right. And uh, it, it, man, it's just weird how all of this stuff works. Like even even like if you go to a holding cell, if you go to a holding cell, <clears throat> on the wall they got a list full of bail bonds, right? If you go on the weekend. <clears throat> If you go on the weekend, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know. Well, my experience, I've been in there, right, uh, for some falsified stuff. But I went in there, and uh, they, um, it was a weekend, so he was telling me that the judge wasn't gonna be there, so you know, call the bail bondsman, right? I was like, man, I'm not about to spend no money on no bail bondsman, right? Because I didn't know that I was gonna have to stay the whole weekend, so. 
he ends up telling me, you know, well, you're gonna have to be here for the whole weekend because Jazz don't get here until Monday. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking on the wall. I'm like, I'm, I'm not gonna stay here the whole weekend. I'm gonna lose out on a lot, of money, right? So I go through flipping through those bell bondsmen. I end up getting a bell bondsman. It, it was like uh, 500 bucks just to come and find out that night that they dropped, they dropped the charges on, you know, and they weren't going to charge me, you know. So after all of that, I, get, I have to end up paying the bail bondsman. I still have to give him $1,500, the 10% of what the bail bonds that they paid, even though, you know, it was all worked out where I'll just give him like 500 bucks and then I'll do some type of payment plan, right? So they wouldn't just keep the 500 that I gave them. They still wanted the whole fifteen hundred, so I had to end up paying that much money, you know. But they yeah. they advertise it all up in there, and it's man, it's man, it's 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 a whole racket, man. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. So you you mentioned Action, you mentioned yeah, you mentioned the bell bonds. Like there's uh, there's a uh, a guy I know who created an app for people who are incarcerated to receive pictures of their family members, et cetera, et cetera. But mm-hmm. uh, when you study incarceration and uh, the politics of like two of the major privatized prisons, like Geo Prison and um, I think it's called CCA, um, mm-hmm. as well as the state and federal institutions, if you, for example, in the District of Columbia, they don't have any state penitentiaries, right? So mm-hmm. in order for this, this is you know, talking about debt in particular, but jumping into states' rights for a second. Um, so in the District of Columbia, because they have no state penitentiary system or, you know, they're not the feds, so they're on the federal penitentiary system, if a person, let's say a young adult, 21 years old or 26 years old, gets arrested and convicted for a crime and has served a sentence, he could be sent as far away as Iowa, North Carolina, yeah. St. Louis, Kansas City, uh, California, and all of these uh, states and politicians have a vested interest in that for a lot of reasons. One is it if you increase the prison population, increase the voter uh, population in a given jurisdiction that you can count toward mm-hmm. your count, whichever I'm not getting into that. But the main point that I was making by mentioning that is that the cost to make a phone call home can be as much as 13 to $17 a minute. Wow. How does that put brown people in debt when we are over 60 to 75% of county and state penitentiaries? $17 mm-hmm. a minute. Like, that's a that's a debt creation cycle because, hey, man, you do want to talk to your mother, right? Mm-hmm. Or your kids or your wife or whatever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, man, that's crazy, man. That's crazy how they could get away with that. But it, it's definitely predatory, you know? And it, it's all it's all a thriving monster within itself, you know, and it feeds off of each other. And it, it's weird. Right. It's weird how all of right. that works when you start digging into it. It uh, right. no, this, most definitely. It's a, I'm just saying it's most definitely um, unfortunate, and uh, the system, um, like it says, I try to get into the into the religion, but it says in the scriptures the system is a beast. We see why. We see why it's described that way. You know what I'm saying? It devours though. It devours the poor. And those mm-hmm. it's, it's a it's a cold world, man. It's it's, it's cut. Yeah, world. it is. Yeah. And, and we're and we're and we're forced and, and we're somewhat forced to participate. If you don't participate in this way of doing things, then you're gonna start. Right. Yeah, you are. Yeah, it, it, so, it does go ahead. So go ahead. No, I just said feast go of ahead. famine. Mm-hmm. Man. Yeah. Now, does anybody uh, on the on the line? I know. Uh, I think Vinny, you mentioned, but have a car note or want to share their experiences with car notes? Uh, something I've personally avoided. Uh, one because at one point I could never afford it, and then when I was able mm-hmm. to afford it, it just wasn't a prudent decision because I found other means. But does anybody want to yeah. share their experiences on car note, either personally or a person that you know, and what challenges in practice you would advise people to be aware of? Uh, I can. Uh, I know Sister Reese ain't chimed in in a minute. She might want to say something. Sister Reese, I'll yield to Sister Reese. Okay. Um, I I do have a personal experience with car notes. I I've, I've had two. I've purchased two cars 
um, on a car note. The first one I paid off fully. The second one I actually voluntarily gave it back because I got married and my husband was not, um, he didn't like how much money was leaving, you know, Mm -hmm. our budget for the car. So he was like, you know, that's just way too much money. I did not have good credit. So, of course, I had a sky high interest rate. Mm -hmm. And he just he just was like, no, <laughs> basically, you know, that's just too much money. So I had to give it back. Um, and that that was that. And I'm very grateful for that because since then mm-hmm. we've purchased three cars now in cash. And we've not had to pay a dime over what the car is actually worth because we pay for it, out, you know, outright. We just pay for it cash. And mm-hmm. that's just how we decide to live now. We actually have our entire budget like that. We pay for our necessities, and we don't live on any amount of credit at all. If we don't have it in cash to buy it, then we don't we don't afford it. We just don't need it. Damn. Hmm. And that's uh, how you know that's way. how we live. Yeah, live and it's way. actually very you know comfortable. Um, it's very comfortable. I I totally enjoy living that way. I don't feel pressure financially. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're never broke. We we never mm-hmm. have to feel like we're pressing to pay for anything, and I mean it is it's definitely a beautiful feeling to take that burden off of my shoulders. I quit my job, um, I work from home. We only have one income, but we make it work because we live simply, and we don't have a need to go out living above our means. Hmm. So that's it, great. It's, it's just a, you know it's a different lifestyle, but it's much better. I don't have. Let me tell you something. I have a closet full of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I don't know. I mean, at this point, I don't think my husband has any closet space. Um, mm-hmm. I cook every single day in my house. We never hungry. I have my car usually full of gas. We have two cars paid for in cash. Um, you know, we just, we live in a single family house. I think it's one, two, three bedrooms, a fully finished basement. Even though, even though we are renting, um, we're, we're getting ready to go through a home buying program. So, mm-hmm. you know, we just have things that we're just doing in a certain order where it is in order. You know, it's like not trying to do things ahead of time, not trying to mm-hmm. look bigger than we actually are before we actually get that big. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> if you're, you know, if your income just can't hold, a luxury lifestyle, then your income can't hold a luxury lifestyle. You don't need to put it on credit. You know, just grow into it. Just grow into it. I think that's our that's problem. Though. We want everything right now. We want everything fast. We don't want to work for nothing. We don't want to build up to anything. We just want it right now, right now, right now. And that's the reason I believe why credit is a thing. Because it plays mm-hmm. on the human emotion and the human um, desire to have and to, to be um, exorbitant and to have all of these luxuries and this comfort. You know, we love a good comfort zone. And we convince mm-hmm. ourselves oftentimes that we need things that we really don't need. Amen. I, to mean, that. Really, I, I, think... I, I don't know how many times I've been in the store and said, oh, girl, I need this shirt because I don't have a blue one. I got a black one. I need this. <laughs> and I'm like to myself, yeah. that's the biggest lie ever. I don't need it anything at all. All I need to do is eat every day and, you know, see my child grow up and, you know, live my life. Well, I, I say uh, it kind of in tandem with that, that uh, the needs are being pushed upon people. And again, I'm just uh, mm-hmm. drawing from a recent experience. Uh, I enjoyed some of the best two months of my life because there was not one television commercial. One, there are no TV commercials, right? No, no Pralazac OTZ, not Ozantic disease commercials, not That's vegan for vegetarian, no beer commercials, no clothing commercials, no car commercials. Like Toyota got 10 commercials, right? One for the Camry, one for the Corolla. Dodge got 10 commercials, right? They got the oh, minivan, man. the truck. Audi got co- none, none, not one commercial, not mm. one. I mean, so... When you are trying to like just live your life and just say, "Hey, man, you know, I, you know, I sold some of my own clothes. I'm really slow, but I, I still try." Uh, and then I got a, <laughs> a, a seamstress or whatever that do my dashikis or whatever. But when it's like, "Okay, hey, I'm gonna get this done," uh, it, yeah, man, it's easier to buy a shirt at Walmart because it's you know six dollars versus have it made, which is a lot more than that. 
but the right. constant barrage of commercialization to the face, the eardrums, you are bombarded. Like, mm. just imagine being in a place where there's no billboards, man. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you going to do? Like, my mind can think all new thoughts because I'm not bombarded with advertising. So, kind of to Reese's point is, um, I used to work in the fashion industry, right? And then there's a movie called The Devil Wears Prada. And at mm-hmm. one point, the lady in the movie, Marsha or whatever her name is, she says that you think that when you walk to a discount store and saw something on sale on sale for six ninety nine that you was getting a good deal. And mm-hmm. she said in the movie, and I'm paraphrasing, but I'm going to try to quote it. She said, we planned that shirt to be obsolete a decade ago. Mm. Like, that's how the fashion industry works. Like, I, I worked in there years ago. Right now it's uh, February. The mm-hmm. the fall and winter line is out at the, the show. So just like these conferences for debt, they do conferences. One is in Vegas called Magic, another one in New York City, all over the place. But the largest ones where the buyers come out to buy clothes, they're putting out stuff for November and December now in the fall in January to spring of next year now, right? Mm-hmm. So you're constantly being bombarded with, hey, buy this car, buy this truck. Hey, your, your veins, hey, you're sick, you're coughing, you got the flu, you need you need a new dresser, you need new furniture, you need a new TV, you need your kids need toys, they need more, they need more toys, more toys, more toys. They need as many toys as possible to keep them busy. And then you got to enroll them in all these programs. You are constantly bombarded with, hey, man, here's another way. You can't meet all your needs. Go come get this credit card or this payday loan so you can get yourself, yeah. you know, satisfied with what we got to offer. Yeah, you know what I'm huge. You see, you, you know, that's oh, one thing that – no, I'm sorry, brother. Go right ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, B.A., one thing. It, it was something that uh that, that, that sister Sister Reese was saying. Everything is based on convenience in this society. Mm-hmm. I need my food fast. I got to have this fast. When I go online to Amazon, I got to have the Prime so I can get that in a couple of days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it's, it's hey, 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 we're not throwing st- stabs at Prime, brother. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm joking. Go ahead. So, Go ahead. So I just ordered a book, man, that's going to be here tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going but, ahead. Hey, no, it's all good, man. But you see, uh, the wanting of material things, the wanting of I gotta have this, I gotta get that. It, it's not necessary. It, it's it's the want. It's I mean, we live in a society and an economic system that's based on hmm. greed. When people people who Somebody are in charge are winning. people. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, everything is based on convenience, man. Like I got to have it right now at the moment. Got to have it. Mm-hmm. So we we most definitely have to understand that that can most it could be an ill, it can be a detriment. Um, and this this way of thinking it it go it affects us on all levels. Like I said earlier, yeah. the way we eat, what we wear, how we how we uh, function on a daily basis. Uh, people's stress levels, people will stress out over the simple, smallest little bit of material thing. Man. It's, I mean, people would just, man. I mean, I'm serious, man. I've seen people beef over, over the, over things not even worth beefing over. The black you know what I'm saying? So, Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> don't even get me started on that. <laughs> But this is how society is shaped. This is how society mm-hmm. is ran. And it's unfortunate that it is that way. And I'm glad we're having this kind of conversation because this is the kind of conversation that needs to be had. Because mm-hmm. just us sharing our ideas or our opinions, this can actually help somebody who may be suffering from these ills of society. Mm. So, yeah, you know what? Mm-hmm. I hope. Yeah, go ahead. You know what's crazy is, like, a few a few of the like the the most well off people that I know or that I communicate with or that I have communicated with in the past they um like one of them this this lady is like this millionaire matchmaker she lives in the thrift store you know she's always buying secondhand stuff 
you know, oh, one of my old landlords, right? He, um, he, he had property all over the place, like from, you know, rental property to, uh, what do you call those vacation properties where people go and, you know, do the timeshare thing with, you know, just a big portfolio of places, right? There's a brother too, but, um, he he drove that you would never even guess it because he wore these beat up clothes. He always drove he drove this old busted down uh, Volvo, right? And it, something wrong with the muffler, he didn't care. It's spitting out white smoke coming up the street, <laughs> you know. But I mean, you would never even know it, man. And they they just never they never want to spend their money on you know nothing new, unless they have to, you know. Now his wife drove a nice car, but. Yeah, no, nah, he he didn't. He he was so modest, man. He didn't spend money on nothing, you know. But I would say that was, most uh, of the people I know that are wealthy, they do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think part of it is you know the de- depreciation of assets if they actually own it, because some put it in their company name and then you know mm-hmm. uh, use it as a tax shelter. But I would say uh, something the sister mentioned. Who else said they didn't have a car note? Oh, I do. I'm like the flip side of Sister Reese. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to try to get you out of that yeah. oppression, brother. Really. But uh, in, in the spirit, well, down, in the spirit but... of, uh, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the spirit of uh, all power to the people, I want to share this resource and drop a jewel in everybody's crown. It's a website mm-hmm. that I shop on and been shopping on probably for the last decade plus. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's called Gov Deals, G O V. D E A L S dot com. And if the audience or anybody on the panel is interested in getting, well, they sell everything on there, but don't, don't get caught in the trappings because you can buy a helicopter, you can buy a boat, you can buy a house. I mean, you can buy everything, but what essentially it is, is the government surplus and Mm -hmm. auction off their surplus. So the last two vehicles I bought, was a uh, Volvo truck and a uh, Chevy Impala and probably spent about six grand for both. I mean, just wow. total. Um, and then before then I had a, another Chevy Impala that was when I bought it had 32,000 miles on it. And I think I got it for 25 or $2,800. And then when I sold it, it kind of sold it. I gave it to a family member, but um I think I left with 116,000 miles on it. So I really put like, you know, 90,000 miles or so on it. Uh, And it's still in good operating condition. So a good resource for people who are trying to avoid a car note. I know different people have different circumstances. Some people get big tax returns, seven, eight thousand dollars Some people get some money. Some people can save up money. Um, But one of the primary routes that I've chosen is, to buy government surplus vehicles and Mm -hmm. when I buy them it positions me to uh, save I've never had a car note Uh, nice wanted one maybe once but Mm -hmm. I don't I don't I'm not a very uh, faithful customer when it comes down to paying people I just I don't (laughs) prefer to be paying that's just not my thing like so when I'm paying bills like you better take this money while it's on my mind so uh, going out the country, yeah, yeah, going out the country. Like here, here go the electric bill for the next five months because I'm not going to be thinking about y'all, right? Yeah. So y'all take y'all, y'all take the money and deduct it out, and then y'all, I rather y'all owe me than me owe y'all. That's just that's the way yeah. I kind of position my mind. But just again, the jewel in the crown is the uh, the government website. That's one. There's quite a few others that's based off of that, but it can position you to get things. Uh, and it's all over the United States relatively cheaply, right? So automobiles mm-hmm. particularly, and just a word of a cautionary tale, I primarily purchase government-owned vehicles, right? Meaning they had it, their fleet maintenance partner, department maintained it every uh, 30 days or every 5,000 miles. You know, full ASC certified technicians was doing diagnostics. Yeah, give me that one with the brand new tires because mm-hmm. y'all got new budgets. Yeah, yeah, give me that one. And uh, it's just a, a means that people won't be trapped into 
some of the same cycle. So. Yeah, because uh, I know, man, with my situation, I know when I when I got out of my debt the first time, or I paid off my school loan, and then I went and um, and I did it because I was mess like I said I was messing with that dude this dude who was heavy into credit, you know. So I started thinking credit, you know, oh I can get this, I can get that. So my my score was high, especially after my first car, and then my secured credit card got another credit card, and then um, I went out and got a, a, a minivan. And I did uh, I did put a little bit of money down on that one. Then I went out and bought a truck, and I didn't put no money down on that one. Walked in, was tossing out my own terms, you know, got got the got the deal I wanted on it. And didn't have to put no money down on it. And then the cold part about it was I stopped, you know, that money wasn't coming in the same way. After a mm-hmm. while, after I bought all those, you know, and then it just kind of like it was just eating me alive, you know. And now I'm kind of yeah. like uh, I fell behind, lost one of the cars, lost the minivan. I still got the truck and the, uh, and my other car, but you know I'm I'm climbing out of that debt, so I know I know better now. And I definitely yeah. have a story to tell my kids, you know, because if if you're in debt, man, you like Sister Reese said, man, without no debt, man, you got a lot of freedom, you know. Oh yeah, and you do. When you move debt, around a certain way. When you're in debt, man, you locked up because you're not really working for yourself. You're working for somebody else, you know. And it's just, it's oh, yeah. just, it's just not a good feeling. And I vowed to myself never to do it again. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, try to pursue alternative means. But I know that, uh, you know, relatives I have, etc. Uh, just because you got good credit and. Yeah, got a oh, got a vehicle already, but hey, man, I mean, I can go get the new Toyota Tundra, or yeah. the new Chevy, yeah. Tundra, and yeah. you know, again, I'm that's not my reality. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't ever look like I got nothing. Uh, I try that's not good. to. I mean, yeah, that's just not my that's reality. Good. But I think even being in a position to buy a luxury vehicle. It's often mm-hmm. a disdain to me. At one point, you know, being a teenager, like, yeah, man, I'm gonna get a Range Rover or such a. You know, that was all. Right. It was nice, you know. It was uh, enticing, but mm-hmm. in, in my adulthood, man, how dare I spend eighty thousand dollars on some tires and some metal to get me from A to B? Mm-hmm. Nah, no, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Right. yeah, when the water comes. Yeah, when it comes to uh, vehicles, man, uh, I've never really had anything entirely brand new. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything I had was old because I can get up in there myself. <laughs> yeah. Do a few twists and turns, oil chase, tune up, and a little bit of everything else, and it's good to go. Yeah. So uh, I'm 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 a, I'm 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 the old school type. I like old school cars, man. So I, as long as I can get up in there at these brand new cars, nah, I'm not even doing it. Nah. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm cool. <laughs> now, has anybody That's ever okay. used any uh, has anybody ever used any payday loan services out? Sal, I don't know if you have any callers, but just kind of extend that question out to anybody else. But has anybody ever been involved in any payday loans, and what did they learn from it? Nah, no payday loans for me. It's uh, cars. Nah, not me. Yeah, not me either. Yeah, I ain't, I I was never into the payday loans. I was always skeptical of those. No, me neither. But I had a friend who uh, was an older guy. I think he was about in his early fifties, and said he was caught in a bubble. So between checks, mm. went out and took out three hundred dollars. And you know, I think they give you. I don't know the, the science on it, but they give you seven days to pay it back, and then the interest rate kind of goes up from you know, 15% to 20% after seven days to 14 days or 21 days, it goes up to 29%. Plus it's a fee for using the money of like $200. So he borrowed $300 and ended up having to pay about nine or 1200 back uh, when it was all over. And again, like it's, it's these systems, right. That people are unaware of now. You know, I don't necessarily encourage uh, not making enough money, but I can see how for many that's a reality, right? There's not 
Mm-hmm. In some cases, there's nothing you can do, right? I mean, not not nothing, but uh, the bills are high. The resources or opportunities or education level, whatever the arbiter of not being able to get uh, sustainable employment, which is ultimately like the people behind pulling the strings. So, hey, man, you're only worth such and such an hour uh, or such and such a salary. But um, that system kind of puts people in a, a, a scenario where they're going to make a choice. Look, I need to get whatever else paid, and I just need money to fill a gap between the next time I get paid. And that'll make them make a compromise mm-hmm. decision to force themselves into debt. And uh, in, the, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about uh, the rich who oppress the poor by making themselves rich, they gonna go into poverty. But it, th- mm. because stuff like that don't happen right away, the poor man just trying yeah. to get groceries for the week or just that bus pass because you know that first fell between the pay period when you need a new bus pass. Man, let me go out here and borrow some money or borrow, and it's a trap. I mean, again, mm. I'm, I'm kind of bringing these things out, but um, I'm not sure. Are any of y'all familiar with how taxes work for in low-income communities when, like, the rapid refunds? Anybody familiar with that? Uh, I well, haven't yeah. had a rapid refund. Yeah. I know they charge money. The oh, rapid yeah, refund is a, a huge source of fraud, and, um, you know, sort of been taking advantage of the people that don't have the income because they'll go to them for the rapid refund, not knowing that 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 refund is going to go to whoever prepared their tax return. And they will take out a chunk of their money before they hand it over to them. So let's say you have a a tax return coming back to you for $8,000. Mm-hmm. Um, the whoever prepared the return will get the check itself or the deposit mm. of the refund, and they'll take out maybe three thousand dollars of that eight thousand and give you five. Um, wow. Well, let's well, but but the thing about it is, is that the five thousand that you get, they'll give you maybe two thousand of it up front, just for getting mm. them to prepare your tax return. So at the end of the day, by the time it's all said and done, you'll get the first up front for maybe two thousand. Then you'll give they'll give you another three thousand to make up your whole five after they actually receive the deposit. But they're gonna take out a chunk of the money wow. up to a third of it. Um sometimes oh, yeah. now sometimes you'll have tax preparers that are um not necessarily authorized or registered agents with um any type of financial institution, they'll just claim themselves to be tax preparers and they'll just start a business saying, oh, I do, I prepare taxes. They'll go around collecting all kinds of people's refunds and skipping town with the whole check. Mm. I've seen it. I used to work for the IRS for eight years and I used to have people on my phone crying, breaking breaking down into tears because somebody took off with their refund because they went for a rapid refund. Oh yeah. Wow. And that type of that type of exploitation of the poor right. uh and the ignorant, right? Because people when you when you are are oppressed while some of us may be able to look mm-hmm. into next year like I'm, you know, working on uh, like hey man, I'm going to go to South Africa next year for two months, three months, whatever. Some people can only work on tomorrow, right? Or like, I'm just trying to get through this evening, right? Wherever I'm asleep at, whatever I need from the evening. And you have people who are being predatory and preying on them, right? And those type of scenarios where, in some cases, like she was explaining, yeah, they setting up charging sometimes four and five hundred percent. Hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. two thousand mm-hmm. percent, like a tax return. Yeah, I, I know I have an accountant now, but I mean, we may pay him a couple hundred dollars to do a tax return. I used to do it myself hmm. on, on whatever the into it or whatever tax refund, whatever the website was. But now, no, no, let's pay somebody to do it. So to go from something that's thirty nine, one hundred twenty seven dollars, even three hundred dollars, 
for somebody who's a licensed, certified public accountant to charging three thousand dollars because you needed mm. it twenty four hours. Wow! Like oh, I'm about to get evicted. Oh, I'm hurting by a car. Oh, my son needs this. Other. Like yeah. the commercials is bombarding you one place, right? You marginalized by the employer in another place. Uh, mm. You got car note, debt, gas, housing, marginalize you. And then it forces you in a position to use what they call low executive function that you can't even see cognitively. This is a very bad decision. Like if I'm doing bad mm-hmm. economically today, then I might as well just wait it out, right? I know. I thought somebody was talking about when they were uh, dealing with the Bell's bonds. List. No, no, no. See, if you, if you pull me, depending on the charge, but you pull me into some type of jail and say, hey, man, you're going to be here for the weekend. I'm just going to wait it out with a book. I'm not paying yeah. you $1,500, right? Because <laughs> these things are exploitative, man. I mean, they, they got are. a whole system set up and say right. everybody can make money off of poor people. Because you, right. you are barricaded into the reality. Listen, I'm tired of sleeping on the floor. I need a couch. Yeah. My, my, my kids is tired of I'm about to, to get my tax refund, and I'm tired of feeling bad about myself. Mm-hmm. I'm about to go dress up and get my hair did and nails done and some new sneakers because I'm sick of feeling bad about myself. And this is mm-hmm. how people get to be drowning in debt. And this is you it. know what the crazy part is? It it not only does it produce uh, people drowning in debt, but it also produces people who don't want to drown in debt, so they become oppressors as well. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. boy, and and it says it in Proverbs, turns, it turns you into the monster, right? Yeah, it says in Proverbs, a poor man who press who oppresses another poor person is a burden. Is it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's even worse. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. that's crazy because we become a product of our environment. We yeah. are a byproduct of the system, and it turns and the, you into a monster. Oh my man. Man, and, and, all that, and all that the, person really wants is to to stop feeling the burden of poverty. Exactly. So you exactly. See, exactly. I mean, y'all watch y'all watch whatever you know. You, you can just watch a YouTube video. Somebody pop on, like, do you want to get into real estate? <laughs> do you want to buy houses? I'll teach you how to make a six fold income every month. Hey, whoa, buddy, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And but even it's all, in the, that, it's all the hustle, man. It's all the hustle. Man, it is so, all the hustle. I come from a family of property owners. Even mm-hmm. in that. I can say oh my, God. my grandmother has four children, mm-hmm. and every one of them had real estate holding. And I tell mm-hmm. you, in an attempt to try to play Monopoly, like what mm-hmm. I've seen, listen, just get one house as small as possible and try to mm-hmm. know everything about that house. Learn about the HVAC system, the roof system, the plumbing, because when the plumber comes and the HVAC man comes and the, and the carpenter coming, man, you're yeah, going to be taxed. Tax. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they catch some good time. Yeah, I'm already knowing. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to definitely get their cut out of there. Yeah, they're going to make sure they get that. Especially Man. if you got it to pay. Because I know when I roll up to somebody's yeah. house, if it look like you got it to pay, you're going to be charged, right? <laughs> if you look like you need some help, you're yeah. going to get a different rate. That's just, yeah. It's a sliding yeah. scale. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. What you do uh, for the Moses Plumbing? I don't know what I do, but I uh, I don't I don't <laughs> okay. no I don't know what it, so I I I uh I mostly do now I run a consulting practice but uh, oh, okay yeah probably yeah, I yeah. do probably about twice a year I'll do a uh, a home improvement job twice a year oh, on, okay. on a less busy year but uh, I'm in yeah. the throes of forming another company now to. Uh, kind of leverage the uh, kind of government resources because charging a homeowner is one thing, right? And mm-hmm. if I come put a roof on, uh, me, Doc, I mean, we've worked on different projects together, but we put a roof on at somebody else. Roof jobs run between, you know, ten, twelve, sometimes $25,000. So mm-hmm. it's one thing to charge it when somebody has insurance to pay, and that's right, the going right. rate. But you can undercut right. that and, and, and you know kind of help the person out. Um, it's another right. thing when the government is saying, "Hey, this is what we pay you uh, to do the same thing that you're gonna do that a homeowner's pay." 
and right. that's less taxing. Sometimes they'll pay for the underprivileged homeowner. So, yeah, I don't do much. I mean, I'm licensed in a, a, a locksmithing, uh, worked in roofing before. Mm-hmm. Used to work as a pipe fitter years ago as, as in, uh, in the trade unions. Um, but yeah. now I enjoy as much as I work, like working with my hands. That's when I want to do it, not when I have to nowadays. Uh, mm-hmm. This is my own house. And right, right. I like to work with my my mind and my hands, but mm-hmm. what I get paid now is just brain work for the most part. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's always good to know that stuff because they, man, people are definitely going to try to run up that bill, and they don't care oh, yeah. either. You know, they don't care. And if you do find somebody to do it dirt cheap, you're probably not going to really get a good job. <laughs> you know. Yeah, in many so. cases. Yeah, they got it. Uh, yep. let, let's take a pause for the cause. I don't know if you have anybody in the listening audience, Sal. Um, I had a couple other things I wanted to chat about, questions or, or thoughts on that, and then I'm going to have to transition off. Yeah, yeah. Once again, family, there's a lot of people listening on the phone lines. Again, if you want to chime in, simply press number one. Uh, we can add you in the conversation. If you're on social media, the number is 319 Again, Again, if you want to chime in, Dial that number and press number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. Uh, so far, uh, nobody's pressed number one. Let's continue, guys. Cool. So, yeah, we talked a little bit about uh, the the banking system, the overdraft fees, payday loans. We talked a little bit about uh, automobiles. Uh, does anybody want to share any thoughts on housing or or rentals, right? Like that's another trap that people fall into. And when I say trap, mm-hmm. I mean sometimes it's getting the wrong place, uh, getting the wrong person that owns the wrong place. Um, interestingly enough, <laughs> again, I'm just drawn from being uh, down in the Caribbean. You know, we talked about rent. People are like, no, no nobody pay rent here. Like, no, <laughs> nobody pays rent. Right? Yeah. Now, the person or the people who pay rent which is a whole nother downside to that, if you want to call it a downside. Um, the person or the people who pay rent are foreigners that come to visit. Like, I pay rent because I was there for, you know, renting, renting somebody's uh, space. But the Cubans themselves, they don't have a system where people pay rent, per se. Uh, hmm. it's, it's very, very minimal that that does happen. Like, if you move from like Trinidad to Havana, for example, and you don't have family there and you find a place, you can rent a bedroom or or rent a house. But most of the housing stock is for the people, not, Mm. you know, necessarily for like the one of the Cubans to rent to another Cuban. Like, no, 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 no. Everybody Mm. got a right to a house here, right? So just want to get your thoughts on uh, housing, your experiences and uh, how that has either aided or, or uh, mitigated some debt that you you may have got involved with. Uh, any thoughts on that at all? Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't really have any debt on renting right now. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just looking. Uh, I'm just cl- trying to clear up all my stuff right now. This so, Benny. Yeah, this Benny. So I'm just. Oh, so to you clear you up. in the bay? So. I know oh that God. houses that were <laughs> twenty thousand in the Bay and, and in the nineties <laughs> were just out there. They're like well, most you know of this the, house is. Yeah. <laughs> you know what the weird thing is? It's like uh, <clears throat> the housing is so expensive out here that a lot of people rent. You know, especially if you're in the city or with you know clo- within close proximity of uh, like San Francisco <clears throat> or or even Silicon Valley which is like Fremont and Redwood City and all out that way, San Jose, out that area. So what a lot of people do is, you know, a lot of people rent, either housing or whatever. And uh, there's such a high demand for it because a lot of people are coming out here for the tech industry. And um, it's it's just outrageously high. Like you you go to the hood, man, and, uh, you know, you'd be in the lower bottoms in West Oakland, you're paying uh, – I don't know, uh, you know, uh, one better, you're going to pay, like, you know, anywhere from 
18 if you're lucky, you know, but all the, all the way up to 3,000, you know what I'm saying? It's, man, it's ridiculous, man. It's, uh, it's, it's just really, really high, you know? And, I mean, and the, and the crazy part is, like, if you know anybody, like, you, you can, you, if you know people, then you can probably get a better deal, you know? Uh, but if you don't know anybody who owns property and is renting it out, then, you know, they're going to ask you for, they're going to ask you for at least uh, first month. Sometimes people ask you for last month, and then they ask you for security deposit. So just to move into a place, you got to have at least, you know, $6,000 just just offhand, you know, just for the down. Yeah. You know. And that that, and, that is only for certain people. Yeah. Yeah. It if is. You make, it if is. you make a, a, I think minimum wage out there is, uh, I think they passed the fifteen dollar law on local. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that ain't nothing. That's nothing. Oh, I know. You know, well, man, that's that's thirty k <laughs> a year. Now, this this is an interesting yeah. thought, and you know, everybody else can share their thought on, uh, just in terms of housing, right? So, in in uh major cities, they have what's called the AMI, right? The, and it's in minor cities too, but it's uh, the area median income, right? So the average mm-hmm. person or family, normally it's by person or family of two, three, or four. Um, but the AMI in Washington, D.C., in that area, so the average average person, right, makes $121,000. That's the average person. Now, obviously, you take in the people who make, you know, $50 million with the people who ain't made nothing, and then combining them together and then getting a denominator over numerator <clears throat> or numerator over denominator. In California, particularly in uh, San Francisco, I was reading an uh, article that was stating that the AMI there, I think, is 96000 or maybe it was 98000 something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the interesting thing in terms of housing. In order to qualify for low-income housing, you know the mm-hmm. threshold that you can make to be low-income in San Francisco? Oh, in San Francisco? Yeah. Low income yeah, in San Francisco. A, uh, I don't know about San Francisco. I know in like Redwood City, it's a hundred, a hundred and twenty some thousand. Yeah, low income in San Fran. In the article, I think it said it was seventy two thousand. That's what quality. Yeah. You can go to the housing authority and say, "Hey, I need a place to stay. I don't make enough money." Seventy two thousand yeah. dollars. That's crazy. So when it comes down to housing, like the way that they call it the market, but the way that the housing stock is regulated by those who have and those who mm-hmm. can afford and, you know, tying in gentrification and all of that. Uh, oh, man. It's profound, man. It is. It definitely is. You know, it's it's uh, it's like people out here making half a million dollars complaining that they can't afford to live out here, you know? Mm. They're, they're, they're complaining. They're actually complaining. So <laughs> the weird part about that is with the $72,000 uh, low-income rule, is what about the people like say for instance you got a household with a with a father and a mother make you know making both minimum wage you know because they don't have no education or nothing and they're only making sixty thousand gross you know what I'm saying yeah. so you're competing oh, yeah. with these these people who are making seventy two a year for low income uh, housing that's 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 kind of that's weird you know. That's, that's really yeah, weird. Your homelessness out there is off the hook now. That's crazy. Oh, man. Don't go to the tenderloins. You know, tenderloins yeah. is all tents and drugs. I mean, man, these, you, you, man, it's, it's so, it's so bad out here, uh, Brother Moses. I'm talking about yeah. bad to where they doing, you know, shooting up, uh, shooting up hot or, or heroin right on the street, you know, in front of the police and the police and the, you got needles on the ground, you know, people, you know, using the restroom all out there, number ones and number twos, you mm. know. It, man, it's just bad. They got to come out there and shoot the sidewalks and stuff down, at, you know, every day, you know, because it's, it's just it's just real bad, man. You know, mm. it's real bad. Oh, yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on uh, housing and how that create, uh, create or, or mitigate debt? But just to let you guys know, uh, we lost uh, Reese. She had to go, but she said she appreciated the, the content in the program. Mm-hmm. Cool. 
I'm not too far behind. Uh, anybody else have any uh, thoughts on housing and, and that? Uh, no, nah, man. It's just it's just all bad, man. It's just all bad. What I think we need is like um, uh, it workshops or people just, you know, having some kind of schooling who's real adept at that, you know, and teaching these kids oh, that, and at a young age. Hmm? That that was my closing question, I guess. Oh, okay. What responsibilities <laughs> do we have? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's it. So what, what responsibilities uh, do the aware have? Like not a, you know, we're aware and, and in terms of like fighting, fighting back against these practices. Yeah. I, I man, you know, so, okay. So, I, I'm talking to my boy. He's a barber, right? We uh, we've already said we're gonna set this up, but we're gonna try to uh, get something going on in his shop, you know, where um, he um, where we just have time, where we just cut kids' hair for free, and then we just have people coming in there and sharing experiences, like older people, or just even you know introducing a new job opportunity that they might be interested in, you know, and just kind of like just kind of like talk about these issues and try to try to help these kids, man. Cause I think, you know, grownups are, I think for the most part, grownups are pretty set in their ways. You know, so we can listen to everything. It's harder to these kids. So I think that's what our main focus will be. But the way that, um, it's, I think we need to just, just educate kind of breaking up any, and, and just show kind of breaking up kind of breaking up a little bit and is that better yeah continue is that better yeah so kids man you know kids and then maybe people let's go breaking up about ways to okay oh no but in the meanwhile VA you want to chime in Uh, VA, are you there? I was step away for a second. Yeah. So is is that better? Yeah, you good. Much better. Okay. So um, yeah. So just just teach the kids, man. You know, because yeah, I'm teaching my kids now, man, not to fall into these lending traps. You know, teach them what to watch out for, things that I fell victim to. So that they will have an easier path, man. Because once you once you get into debt, man, and if you don't have nobody to help you out, you know, where where you can like fix your stuff, or if you're getting bad advice, or you just you know all your peers is just doing the you know living it up like Sister Reese was saying, living past their means, then you're gonna you're gonna fall back into that trap, you know, and and basically teach them that all these uh videos and ads, all this stuff lies to you, you know. Nobody really lives like that, really, except for the people that are really well off. And then also the people that are trying to live the same way that the well off are living, you know. But just stay away from all of that stuff, man. Try to buy everything in cash. If you don't have no cash, you know, don't you don't need it, you know. I, I don't know. I think money management skills will be, uh, is what we need and what we, we really lack. Was it a BA you got any thoughts? Yeah, I think BA stepped away from his phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, my my uh my thought is uh just continuing to share with people uh the what is happening, like and mm-hmm. how they can avoid it, but then also um kind of creating havens for people. So just kind of studying the history of different uh Groups who rose up against like the oppression at large and the poverty and the people who were scheming mm-hmm. on the poor to help them by mm-hmm. whether they were offering uh, food programs or housing programs or mm-hmm. uh, activities to help them be aware that this thing you know, political education like this is what's happening and these are the things that you can do about it because sometimes like the the victim tends to feel powerless. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm not a sheep in, in the in the sense of being an animal, but I, I can't imagine what it feels like that a uh, a fox or a tiger done trapped you and you 
you just got to stand there. Just uh-huh. it's over. You know, you can't go uh-huh. nowhere. And you know, it's our job to kind of hurl some rocks at at that that fox or that sheep, or you know, hurl a some sharp <laughs> to fight him off. Yeah, yeah. people out here right struggling. You know? Yeah, people are out here struggling. So yeah, those are my thoughts. If, if BA had anything to add, if not, I'm uh, ready to close out. Yeah, yeah. I think BA still still away from the phone. We can close out though. Cool. Yeah, that's that's uh, all I had. Just wanted to talk about uh, debt and how the cycles of debt are created. We doubt we dove to, dove in to that a little bit, but the audience should be aware that there are uh, industries that are predicated and exist off the sheer ignorance of people, and they capitalize off of charging somebody, you know, a thousand dollars for something that costs a dollar, yeah, or whatever the end product is. So people should be aware of that and just kind of search deeply to find out to try to avoid being caught in those circumstances. So appreciate everybody time chiming in and everybody who listened on the rebroadcast. Yep. Thanks, uh, last Darryl, words, thanks Brother Moses. Yeah, thanks, Al. Thanks, Brother Moses. Thanks, B.A. Uh, good topic, um, Brother Moses. And I think there's a lot to be learned from it, you know, just especially bringing awareness to it. So that's all. Hey, faithful listeners and thinkers. My name is Reese Roberts, and I'm the host of a new podcast called Entertain the Thought, now available on SoundCloud and www.reeseroberts.com. The website and podcast are focused on teaching consciousness and human evolution in current social conditions. As a free member, On ReeseRoberts.com, you'll have access to curated content like videos and free book downloads. You can also schedule personal consulting services for teenagers, singles, and married couples. I also offer an enrichment training program that teaches students the fundamental arts of research and debate to increase their knowledge of self. The T-Team is now open for enrollment. For more information, please visit www dot serve incorporated dot com backslash register again that's www dot s e r v incorporated dot com backslash register thank you very much for tuning in to debate talk for you radio don't touch that dial you're now listening to debate talk for you radio